All right, I'd like to explain in brief um, how the finite element method works. Uh, so for, for many of you, you may know that the finite element method um, is often consumes an entire course worth of work. So there is some very deep um, mathematical theory and just technical methodology behind how you implement the finite element method if you have to actually code it. But um, I'm not really trying to do all of that. Um, really what I want to do is explain to you how the finite element method works. Like what are the fundamental principles by which it actually solves a partial differential equation. And in th for that, it doesn't really require an entire course. I can at least explain the method to you um, somewhat briefly. Um, the finite element method, um, in a nutshell, is based on what's called the weak form of a differential equation. I told you the math was going to be somewhat, uh, somewhat deep. Okay, so what I'm about to show you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from a differential equation and I'm going to show you what the weak form is and how we turn that into the finite element method. Okay, so what I'm, gonna, what I'm about to show you works for any differential equation, it, not just specifically the ones that I'm gonna show you, but so that it looks a little bit easier and we can deal with it like without too much math, I'm gonna show you an example with a one-dimensional steady state conduction equation. So this is essentially the Laplace equation in one dimension. So the, the most complicated form would look like um, d dx of the thermal conductivity times d d temperature dx plus maybe some internal heat generation equals zero. So that's our one-dimensional steady state uh, heat conduction equation. That's not exactly what we're going to solve in the finite element method. What we're going to do is recast that a bit. Um, so what? So there's something called the weak form, and the way it works is like this. I take the original differential equation on the left-hand side, which was equal to zero, so I always move it like if there was a left hand side and a right hand side I'll just like subtract off let's say the right hand side so that the total thing is equal zero um, so is, if you have something some some differential equation that's equal to zero then I can always do this I can integrate over the domain o over which we're gonna solve the differential equation and multiply by a factor um, that I'll call W of X it's a weighting function um, so I'm going to take the original, the original differential equation, multiply it by this weighting function, integrate all of that over the domain of the solution, and uh, that'll still be equal to zero because the original differential equation was equal to zero. So like this little bit here was equal to zero, so whatever function I put here doesn't really matter. Um, this integral will have to still be equal to zero. Um, if that's true for any function w of x, then, um, well, that should that has to be true for any func function w of x, um, because, again, the thing in brackets was equal to zero. So that's called the weak form of the differential equation. If you integrate, um, if you can integrate, um, you know, any solution or approximate solution for t of x and it turns out that you know for any function you choose you get zero then I claim that is exactly equivalent to the original equation why well imagine that I had some let's let's call it a potential solution for t of x let's suppose that at some location within the domain any location within the domain um, so at any particular position x, if it turns out that this thing's not exactly equal to zero using that potential solution for t of x, then since this was supposed to hold for any function of x, I could choose a delta function. If I had chosen a delta function centered on that location where, um, where this thing wasn't equal to zero, then I wouldn't get zero when I integrate. So then I wouldn't obey the weak form, or I, I wouldn't obey this equation. And so if I can ever find a, play, a, a function w of x where this is not equal to zero, then it's not a solution. Um, therefore, um, basically, this equation, the original equation, and the second equation over here, the, the weak form, have exactly identical amount of information in them. It's just that the weak form looks a lot more complicated, and it seems like a much more difficult argument to make. 
but it is ultimately mathematically equivalent. So that is really like the thing that sets you off on doing the finite element method. So, so here's the two, so there are basically two key ideas of how we use this weak form of the equation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct an approximate solution for t of x. So like I'm looking for t of x in this equation. Um, I don't know how to get it necessarily, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna form an approximation of t of, t of x using a, um, a test function with a bunch of degrees of freedom. So in practice, this is usually a polynomial. So I'll choose like an n degree polynomial or something like that. And, that, and I'll try and construct the best polynomial that I can that makes this thing as close as it can to being zero. Um, so then what I'm gonna do, so there's a little bit more to it. So I have n degrees of freedom. So this is only one equation. So how do I solve for the n degrees of freedom? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a bunch of different test functions. So this, this equation, the weak form, was supposed to hold for any test function. So what I'll do is I will construct n different tens, test functions. So however many degrees of freedoms I have up here, I'll just use that many different test functions. And if I can get this t of x to, you know, for the, each test function to equal zero, then I think hopefully I'll be doing a pretty good job. Um, so for each different test function we come up, we'll require that our approximate solution satisfies this equation. Exactly. So we'll, ex we'll require that for that test function, our test fun our, uh, our t of x, our approximate t of x, will exactly satisfy this weak form. And the hope is that if we construct you know, the test functions judiciously and we use a de a, uh, an approximate form of t of x that you know can potentially represent the the correct solution that um, you know we get a something that looks pretty close to the actual temperature profile when we're done so um, if I look at that that'll give us n equations so um, one equation for each test function we use and there are n unknowns uh, one for each degree of freedom in our test function for temperature